Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hey, great. Welcome back to the um, afternoon session. Uh, by the way, my name is Andrew Phillips. I lead the biocomputation group here at MSR Cambridge. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Marta Kwiatowska. She's traveled all the way from Oxford today to uh, give this talk, so we appreciate that. Uh, Marta is professor of computing systems at Oxford University, and she's a fellow of Trinity College, Oxford. She's uh, won numerous awards, including the Milner Lecture in recognition, recognition of her work, and she's also a fellow of the British Computer Society. Uh, she's a world expert in probabilistic verification, and she led the development of the PRISM probabilistic model checking tool, which has been used internationally to verify a range of systems from computer communication and security protocols to power management systems and more recently biological systems. And today she's going to talk to us about some of the work she's been doing in uh, reliably computing molecular walkers. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, it's very nice to see you all here. Um, on such a hot day. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, what I've been doing for the last three years, but it started about 10 years ago when the PRISM probabilistic model checker that Andrew has just uh, mentioned uh, started uh, to be used for verifying biological systems. Now from biological systems we have moved to DNA computation. And what I'm going to talk about is how you can compute with DNA, but I will focus on molecular walkers. And I suppose I need to introduce the topics. What does it mean to actually compute with molecules, and specifically with molecular walkers? Uh, so first of all, I would like to uh, get you to think about how we compute these days on computers. We compute at the micro scale, but molecules, DNA, are all at the nano scale. We are talking about 10 to the minus 9. Uh, and I'm showing you examples here of two types of molecules that I've worked with. Here is the human FGF protein. Uh, and the other one, this is uh, well known to everybody, this is the DNA molecule uh, which stores the genetic code. Uh, it's this, it's two nanometers, uh, but the length can be huge. You can create uh, strands of DNA which, are, uh, which uh, consists of thousands and thousands of these so-called base pairs. Uh, what we also know is that DNA can hybridize, that is, it can form into a helix. The helix structure, Crick and Botson have discovered it, and also so did Rosalind Franklin. So this is DNA, but of course the primary focus of uh, DNA has been biology, has been in biology to try to explain the secrets of life. But now, uh, what we want to do with it is we want to do molecular programming. Molecular programming involves uh, the application of computational concepts and also design methods to nanoscale devices, uh, computing devices, and nanoscale robots, biochemical systems. Uh, now, molecular programs are networks of molecules. They are networks of molecules, and what these molecules can do is that they can react. For example, hybridization is an example of a reaction between two single strands of DNA. They can also interact, they can move. Now, the key observation is DNA, we know it stores genetic code, so it is very useful for storing information. But DNA is also programmable. We can program it in a sense that we can control the molecules to actually compute, to deliver to us the results that we want. And this is what I'm going to uh, talk about today. Now, uh, this computation also proceeds autonomously. It's just autonomous. Okay. 
Uh, and of course, from my perspective, I'm a computer scientist, uh, and I imagine you are also computer scientists. This is a very exciting new field, uh, and a field in which, because this is molecular programming, we want to do programming. What we want to have is programming languages. We also need new design environments, and of course, we all have to work with experimentalists. Uh, because you need to prove you need to prove that these devices work uh, in real life. Uh, so you might ask, what is a molecular program? Well, a molecular program, if you remember your chemistry, maybe you have studied chemistry um, for your A levels or during the degree, this is simply a set of reactions. You choose some species. And you, these species react together. Uh, they can bind, they can unbind. And this is one example where you have species A, B, C, and D. Uh, this is also known as a chemical reaction network, which has been studied uh, in chemistry, in theoretical chemistry, for some time. So in effect, here, we are computing with chemistry. But how does DNA come in? Well, uh, there is this one important fact which has been established both theoretically and experimentally, and that is that any finite CRN can be implemented with DNA molecules. Any finite CRN. So you can compute it using uh, reaction chemical reaction networks, biochemical reaction networks, and you can then implement them uh, experimentally uh, using DNA. So here, DNA is used as an information processing material. Okay? We are using it as a material to build artificial devices. So this is a little bit different from biology. We want to build artificial devices, and we want to, these devices to compute. And there are several technologies that exist. The one that is well known, and Luca Cardelli and Andrew Phillips have a tool uh, that uh, supports it, is called DNA strand displacement systems. Uh, OK, so how do we compute with DNA? And in particular, how do we compute with DNA walkers? Well, first of all, digital circuits, as you know, digital circuits compute Boolean functions uh, using uh, NAND or AND gates. So they work with bits, zeros and ones. Uh, they really represent low and high voltage. Uh, but this is a discrete, this is a discrete process where you start with some configuration of zeros and ones and you produce some other output of zeros and ones. And we also know that verification, which is my field of research, is very well established uh, as a design methodology to ensure that these circuits uh, co uh, behave correctly and compute the correct results. Now, DNA computation is different. You need to think this is one form of DNA computation. It has been described as computing with soup. Uh, and uh, what that means is you, you take a test tube and you put into that test tube lots of uh, DNA molecules. Uh, you have to design them in such a way that they can bind in the correct order and produce the result. You can then observe the finished result by something like fluorescence. And this is an example uh, from a paper uh, by Lulu and Eric Winfrey where they have designed a DNA program which consists of 130 strands um, and it can compute as square root of a four-bit number. Okay? So notice the inputs here are strands, and the outputs that are produced are also strands. They are not zeros and ones. They are specific DNA strands. Now, this is slow. Okay? This is slow and, of course, doesn't do much, but this is a proof of concept. It computes in about 10 hours. But I'm going to uh, show you how we can do uh, this type of computation faster. Now, the second example that I have of what DNA can do is DNA can fold into structures. Okay? It can uh, fold into nanostructures, and people have been very 
inventive in trying to show what kind of structures. This is known as DNA origami following Rotherbund. Uh, and this is just one example. I've also seen a map of China. People have made boxes, etc. Now, this is also programmable in a sense that you can choose your design. Okay? You put it in a test tube and it forms just like this. It forms from one very long circular DNA strand, which is pinned together in place uh, by short strands, which we call staples. And I'm working uh, with Andrew Turberfield at Oxford. And in Turberfield lab, they build these kinds of structures. This is the actual picture uh, from the AFM. Uh, atomic force microscopy, and this is the tile which has been designed like this. You can see there is the single circular strand, and it is pinned down uh, with these staples. Okay, so this is an origami tile, and to give you an idea for how it works, oh, here is a video which will show you the process. So this is the single circular strand which we call a template strand and it's in solution. So in solution you'll have lots of these but you also put in staples and these staples can bind because they rely on hybridization, they bind to specific sections of, of the template by Crick and Watson base pairing. So this is, of course, not the real picture. This is an artist's impression. I showed you the real picture. Uh, And now you have the tile. OK, there you are. So in the design that I showed you, we have 76 staples. OK, 76 staples and about 2,500 base pairs in the template. OK. Ah, but now what we can do and this is, again, some work uh, that comes from Turberfield Lab. Uh, what we do is we take an origami tile, and on that origami tile, we can print tracks. Print, print in quotes. Uh, what that means is that we put single DNA strands, we attach them to the tile, and uh, we make them into tracks. And then you have another DNA molecule. And that molecule starts by being attached at the beginning of the track. And then you experimentally force it to detach and attach to the next track. And this is what a molecular walker, and I'm talking about DNA walkers, because I'm talking about uh, uh, the technology that was developed in Andrew Turberfield's lab. And uh, it is all made from DNA. It can also carry cargo. So the idea is that this is a nano robot which will actually deliver something, you know, directly in situ at the, at the nano scale. Uh, now, uh, to show you, this is a 2011 paper, and what you can see here is a real-time video, but this is the time in seconds, this is a real-time video of the origami tile, and what you notice is that this is a random process. So this walker doesn't jump immediately, it's a random process, it just looks for a place but then uh, jumps back and forth until it irreversibly now jumps to the next position at around 450 seconds, so it is faster, and then here it jumps to another position. 
Okay, so this is how we do computation with molecular walkers. Uh, so the walker stepping action in more detail uh, is as follows. So first of all, on this DNA tile, we print these tracks, that is, we attach single DNA molecules, and you, you can form them into branching circuits. So it's a decision tree. Uh, initially, they are all blocked. That means you attach a DNA strand so that no other strand can attach to it at the top. Okay? Then they are programmable in a sense that you can selectively decide which sections of the track to unblock. You unblock them by adding specific enzyme that will cut these sections. So we started off with this kind of circuit where these were unblocked and these two branches were blocked. And now we have unblocked that. Okay? Now, at, uh, the walker is a molecule which carries a quencher, and the idea is that this quencher will be used to signal that it has completed the computation, but you can attach true or false, you know, depending on this is not false fluorescence, you can attach different color to detect whether it got to the true. Okay, I have detected cancer or to the false node. No, I haven't detected anything, but I have completed my computation. And then the walker itself, okay, in this random process, in this random process, you again use uh, certain enzymes to make it detach from its initial position and then move on to the next position. But as I said, you know, it, it's a random process, and in fact, the observations show that it can jump over one or even two anchors, but not three, not three anchors, okay? So this is more like the computation that we are used to, because it is a decision circuit. It is a decision circuit which you can also program. Uh, and in fact, DNA walker circuits that we have studied are um, uh, circuits which, um, which were derived from experiments in Turberfield Lab. And in those experiments from which the video comes, uh, what they did is they had these so-called single junction and double junction binary trees. Okay, so binary trees. So in general, this, I mean, this is a proof of concept. So of course, in general, you can compute on any branching, you know, binary tree. But in fact, there is no reason to actually force the computation into a binary tree. And this is an example that I'm showing you where this circuit starts here in this initial position and uh, computes exactly the same function as that circuit, but it does it more reliably and it also does it more efficiently. How do we know? Because we have empl uh, employed quantitative probabilistic verification in order to establish this. Now, this technology uh, that I showed you um, is um, only a single use technology. Okay, so you build this device you use it once, you cannot reuse it. Uh, um, and the, it also burns anchors. So it, the uh, walker cannot walk back. Now they are, uh, in Andrew Turberfield's lab, they are now working on uh, a technology where you do not burn anchors and therefore you will be able to reuse the computation. Now, unlike the uh, computation in solution, this computation is different because the reactions in solution happen in a well-mixed situation, the computing with soup, where we can rely on something like mass action kinetics to tell us uh, how about the dynamics, about the dynamics of the process. But here, the actual rates are localized because the walker has to jump from one position to the next position. So in fact, we had to fit uh, the model to experimental data to actually derive the rates. 
Okay, so why DNA programming? Well, uh, DNA is very versatile. It is also easily accessible. It's cheap, and it's easy and cheap to synthesize as well. So you just design uh, you know, the sequence of base pairs, and you can actually order it, and it gets delivered. It is also very good for biosensors. Okay? Because it can connect, it can interface to biological systems, uh, to chemical systems, and it can use, it's programmable, so it can be used to uh, identify a specific substance. For example, is this you know, a dangerous molecule? And then, if you deliver uh, a medicine in a box, you can actually control the release of the opening of the box, and you can treat it. This is sometimes known as the doctor in the cell. But of course, for com us computer scientists, the nanoscale uh, offers great opportunities to defeat Moore's law. Okay, if we can move to the nanoscale and we, if we can actually build devices uh, reliably uh, using some kind of combinations of DNA circuits, origami, etc., then uh, you know we can move the field of computer science forward. Now, uh, what I have been focusing on is how the field of quantitative verification can actually help in ensuring that, for example, these biosensors work reliably. That is, can we find bugs in the same way as you can use model checking to find bugs, but also can you compute um, how fast the method is? So how fast would the walker with a particular design uh, work? Notice that stochasticity is essential. We've seen it on the video. And the reliability of the computation is an issue because the walker can not only jump over one or two anchorages. What it can also do, it can actually jump off uh, if you have several tiles in a solution, it can jump from one tile to another. So reliability of the computation is an issue, but we want to use uh, that technology for biosensing. So what I'm going to uh, talk about now is a quick tour of what we did, focusing mainly on the molecular walkers computation. And this can be described as modeling, verification, and synthesis for DNA walkers. So this lecture is concentrating on DNA walker circuits. And I'll say a little bit about what probabilistic model checking uh, is, what PRISM can do, uh, what you can use it for, and you know, what you can use it for um, when you apply it to DNA computing. We have actually used it to find a bug in a D D DNA program. Uh, we have analyzed reliability of molecular walker circuits. And uh, we have also developed techniques that allow us to actually synthesize rate parameters for uh, the walkers so that we can guarantee a specific level of reliability or performance. Um, so the question that's driving this talk is what, what good is you know, probabilistic verification uh, in this context? So modeling, OK? What does modeling mean? Now, if you are um, familiar with you know, uh, molecular structures, say biochemical reactions or you know, CRNs, you would probably be familiar with uh, the deterministic approach uh, uh, for the modeling. So we assume, you know, is, assume in your soup you have n different molecular species which react. You then assume that you have a fixed volume, constant pressure and temperature. And then with the continuous deterministic approach, uh, you can uh, write down in quite a mechanical way uh, functions, um, ODEs, ordinary differential equations, which uh, tell you uh, how the average concentration, concentration of 
each molecule uh, you know, develops over time. So we can analyze its dynamics. But there is an alternative approach, and that approach is known as the discrete stochastic approach. So what we do with the ODE approach is we simply approximate the numbers of molecules with, with a real valued function. Okay? But with a discrete stochastic approach, we take the soup, okay, and you consider discrete states in that soup, and each discrete state is then a vector, which is as wide as the number of species, and each component of the vector is the number of molecules of that species. And then uh, the from these states evolve because the molecules, if there are molecules that are close by in, in the state vector, then they can react and it can evolve and you move to another state. So what we do is we obtain discrete state stochastic process and in fact if you model uh, the same system are using either ODEs or you know, discrete stochastic modeling, you may get different answers. And this is well-known well known, uh, folklore information, uh, which is very easy to explain, but I'll explain uh, if you ask me a question afterwards. Uh, so what we do with the discrete stochastic approach is we view the system as uh, a system, you can think about it as a transition system, where the states are these vectors, okay, as wide as the number of species, which have you know, population counts of each molecule, and the transitions correspond to reactions. Uh, now, it's a stochastic approach because thanks to Gillespie, uh, there is a way to actually describe its dynamics probabilistically as a function as a function which describes the probability of being in a particular state, so in, this, in a particular discrete vector at a specific time. Now, stochasticity, stochasticity uh, is uh, very important in the case of molecular walkers, uh, and this model is particularly good of for um, when we want, when we have to handle small numbers of molecules. If you have large numbers of molecules, you can just deal with average concentrations and then the approximation is uh, very good. Uh, but when you have low numbers of molecules, and in, in particular a DNA walker is just a single molecule, uh, then, um, uh, then we need a model like this. Now, it also happens that if you can put these assumptions uh, on uh, the volume, uh, then the model that you get is a stochastic process, but it's a process which is very well known, and it is known as a, a continuous time Markov chain. And in the continuous time Markov chain, rates only depend on the states, they do not depend on time. So for uh, the Walker computation, we can work with this type of model. But unfortunately, for modeling of the origami folding, we have to go beyond this model. We can still work with CTMCs, but we have to work with so-called inhomogeneous CTMCs, where inhomogeneous CTMCs uh, uh, allow you to have rates that depend on time. Now, because we have obtained a CTMC, we can now apply probabilistic verification techniques. And this is just a picture of what this means, you know, concretely. So you may have these reactions. So A and B can bind and unbind. This is a reversible reaction. Uh, and here is another one which can disappear, uh, what I derive is a continuous time mark of chain where each state, this is the number, has, we are starting in a state which has just two A's, two B's, and zero A B's, okay? And this is the full 
CTMC, I'm showing you all the transitions, assuming I'm starting with two A and two B molecules. Now, because this is in solution, I can rely on mass action kinetics, and mass action kinetics uh, tells me that the rates of moving to the next state are proportional to the numbers of molecules that are participating in the reaction. Now, so this is a full CTMC, but just two and two molecules. Uh, but in a real test tube, in a soup, you can have billions, okay? You can have billions. So the principles are exactly the same, but you are going to have an absolutely huge continuous time map of chain, which is the main challenge. So what uh, we want to do is we want to take our DNA program and that DNA program in solution is going to be described by a set of reactions. You also need to specify the initial conditions and to decide how many molecules of each species you have. And you obtain then a continuous time Markov chain. What you uh, also give into a probabilistic model checker such as PRISM, you give it a specification. And the specification is then expressed in temporal logic, but this temporal logic is also <coughs> probabilistic. Because in a probabilistic system, uh, and just, you know, in this we want to talk about the probabilistic evolution of the states over time. Uh, so what this formula is saying informally is that the probability that eventually, F means future eventually, uh, by time t, I reach a state where I've failed, okay? So I failed, for example, to detect the given molecule. Uh, so that probability is less than 0.01, okay? If it is my biosensor, okay, you would want this probability to be small if it has failed, you know, in some sense. You would want this probability to be small. Now, if you input uh, a model, you know, or a description of the model of that DNA program and that property, what you would get out of PRISM is uh, either the answer yes, this biosensor satisfies that property, or not, if it doesn't, okay, that means it, you know, has a flaw which you would need to fix, but you might also obtain quantitative results. Okay, quantitative results means that you will be plotting the probability, or maybe I'm not talking here, you can also talk about rewards and expectations against the parameters of the model or the property. And uh, PRISM is a probabilistic model checker that was developed in my group. Uh, we've been working on it since 1999, and fortunately, uh, for this field, it supports CTMCs and also supports a logic called continuous stochastic logic. And with la that logic, you can express the properties that I've showed you before. Mm -hmm. It also supports four other models, uh, but they are not relevant in this case. And it is now connected to Visual DSD. It is a backend to Visual DSD. So, for example, if you are using Andrew Phillips's Visual DSD, you can output prism models of the, you know, DNA um, DSD strand displacement programs. Now, for the property specification, I'm giving you here uh, a couple of more uh, properties that you could check. Uh, the first one is the probability of deadlock. Uh, it turns out that molecular walkers can deadlock, and I'm going to show you how. Uh, so you want the probability of eventually reaching deadlock to be small. Uh, and another example is what is the maximum probability of the walker eventually finishing in, say, 10.5 time units. You want this probability to be high, but you want the maximum probability where here we filter over all the possible initial states. 
And this is something that PRISM can compute for you if you give it a specification, a description of uh, a DNA, of, of a chemical reaction system or, you know, a DNA program. But you can also plot these quantitative results. So you can have parameters, you can, uh, instead of specifying the band, you can just simply say question mark, that means PRISM will return the probability and that probability can be plotted against uh, different parameters in the model or, uh, or the form. So what's involved in quantitative probabilistic verification? Uh, well, if you are familiar with conventional verification, model checking, it deals with transition systems and temporal logics, but it doesn't have probabilities. Here, the transition relation is probabilistic. Uh, so what we need to do is we actually need to work with matrices, uh, matrices which give you the probability of moving from one state to another, okay? So we may have these absolutely huge matrices, if you wanted to represent, say, billions of molecules. Uh, so in, in addition to employing conventional graph-based analysis, uh, what we also have to do is we have to do numerical computation. We actually have to compute the probability. We also want to compute the rewards, which uh, involves computing expectations. And that uh, employs linear equations, solving, uh, and other numerical approximation methods. Uh, but there is also another, an alternative, which is known as statistical model checking, which relies on simulation that is uh, invoking simulation runs, a large number of simulation runs of the system, checking each run against the prop property, and then estimating the probability, uh, you know, that it holds. So this is a statistical method uh, used, you know, in machine learning as well. Uh, so the state of the art is actually hasn't changed much in terms of the largest size of the model that we can deal with uh, because of the, you know, the early um, design of uh, PRISM allowed us to represent uh, these large matrices very compactly, uh, but there has been, in, apart from statistical model checking, uh, there has really been no other development. But we are moving towards compositional, towards compositional verification, and with compositional verification, the idea is that you can divide your large model into components and then put the results together. So uh, PRISM is based on uh, symbolic implementation. By symbolic implementation, I don't mean SATSMT, I mean binary decision diagrams. Uh, PRISM uh, is able to store these huge matrices of something like 10 to the 10 states very compactly using a variant of uh, binary decision diagrams, which is known as multi-terminal decision diagrams. So if you know about BDDs, then they have 0 and 1 as nodes. MT BDDs can have real numbers as nodes. Uh, but uh, if you store a matrix uh, and if there is regularity in the system, this is the same as for conventional BDGs, uh, then this matrix can be stored very compactly. What you can then do is you can actually perform numerical computation with that matrix, e typically iterative <coughs> techniques, because with iterative techniques, you do not change the matrix. You just simply multiply the matrix by the vector. So the limitation there tends to be the size of the vector, which has to be full, rather than the size of the matrix. But the simulation-based methods, which is statistical model checking, they do not actually build the state space. You can store the syntactic representation of the model, so you can have billions of these, uh, what you need to do is to decide the precision with which you want to obtain your answers, and also the time bound. 
Okay? And then you generate a very large number of runs depending on the precision, and you can obtain an estimate of the probability with confidence intervals. So generally speaking, these methods are uh, less precise than the numerical solution methods, but they can handle much larger systems. Okay. So historically speaking, um, we started working in PRISM in 1999. We released it in 2001. Uh, and at the time, we were working with networking protocols and randomized distributed algorithms. This was the focus. Uh, and it wasn't me who actually realized that you can use PRISM uh, to model molecular networks. It was Mafi Calder and, and her group who realized it. Uh, and they actually uh, developed a model of a molecular signaling network. Now, molecular signaling networks is something that biologists tend to work on because they want to understand how, you know, uh, sort of different aspects of our body work. So, you know, we then worked with uh, biologists in order to develop a scientific understanding of another molecular signaling network which is called FGF. And with that, uh, we managed to produce predictions which were then experimentally validated in the lab. So the objective of that first work was to really help biologists to understand, you know, to, to have some rigorous analysis of the molecular network so that they can come up with some crucial insight. They don't really know how these networks work because they cannot observe them, okay? They cannot observe them. They have guesses, they only have hypotheses, and what we can do is we can put in a hypothesis in a PRISM model, develop a prediction, and then we get an answer. Okay. But since 2012, thanks to Luca Cardelli, who put me onto it, uh, we have been working with DNA computation. And the difference is that DNA is used as an information processing material. So what we are doing is we are working with experimentalists, but these experimentalists are simply using DNA in order to uh, devise such uh, devices and, uh, you know, so computing, uh, computing machines and, and robots, okay? Now, scalability, uh, unfortunately, still remains a huge challenge. Okay, so just to give you an example of what we have done is, uh, this is a DNA transducer, uh, which uh, was formulated by Luca Cardelli, and it is uh, a DNA program which works with uh, these double strands with this overhang, which is called a toehold, and also single strands. And for example, this uh, toehold can attach to that toehold and displace this single strand. This is what DSD DNA strand displacement is. Now, if you have a transducer, a transducer just simply takes in a strand of some type and produces a strand of another type through this kind of uh, hybridization reaction. You can put them together into cascades, but of course all these cascades are then mixed together in the same soup. Okay? Uh, and what can happen is then you have to be very careful about the design so that you do not cause crosstalk, which is unwanted interactions from one transducer to another transducer, which is further down in the cascade. And in fact, there was a transducer flaw, which Luca uh, discovered himself, uh, but we can now discover it automatically in PRISM. And what it is, is it's a computation which leaves a reactive gate that is something with this toehold exposed, which can undesirably react with another molecule from, uh, you know, some other part of the uh, um, um, uh, gate, another gate. And uh, this can be 
established by analyzing this DNA computer program, which we then model in, in PRISM, I mean, visual DSD I've put to PRISM, um, as checking for deadlock. Okay? So there are two types of deadlock. One type of deadlock is correct computation. Okay? I've finished, and the computation has finished correctly, but the other one is incorrect. Uh, and you can also show the probability of each deadlock and the two probability plots are slightly different. So this is computing in solution where we could rely on mass action kinetics. Uh, but for DNA Walker circuits, we cannot do that uh, because the reactions are localized. So the DNA strands actually react with whichever strand they find in, along the track, okay, along the track. So what we had to do in this case is, um, I'm just showing you, if you are interested, we also studied uh, expressiveness of DNA walkers, and it turns out that they can compute exactly the Boolean functions, and this is the one specific technology, uh, but there was one problem, and that is these circuits have to be plain. Okay? And the intuition, I think it should be clear to you, that the tracks of the walker cannot cross because this will not compute the, uh, the correct Boolean function. Uh, and in fact, what we did is uh, we uh, came up with a way to transform, this is XOR, which has a non-planar graph, okay, we, to transform these crossing lines using gadgets, okay, and gadgets have a join, okay, a join node and then a trivial fork node. So it's just joins to reroute. You simply reroute the walker. But by reduction to three CNF, any K CNF formula, you know, can be represented by 3CNF. So by reduction to 3CNF, we can show that this technology can compute uh, all Boolean functions. But this technology is also very unreliable, okay? Uh, very unreliable. So, for example, experiments show that only 87% of walkers follow the correct path. So they can jump to another track, they can jump over one or two anchorages, they can even jump to another tile, which we can prevent by, for example, uh, attaching the tiles to a surface. Uh, but what can happen is that if they jump over two, they can actually deadlock. So notice that because they jump, they can jump over two but not three, if it then jumps backwards to that one, which is reachable, okay, it's within the rules because it just jumped over, so it's, okay, it was attached, then it's deadlocked, okay? And we can actually check for deadlock, okay? But what we had to do first is we had to develop a model. Uh, so we had to devise a CTMC model uh, but that model could not rely on, uh, you know, uh, um, so published information about, you know, kinetic constants. We actually had to fit the model, the rates of the model, to experimental data. Um, and this is uh, an example. So in the experiments of the Walker uh, that I showed you, the video that I uh, showed you, they devised single junction and double junction circuits. So we developed a model based on simplified stepping uh, process that I showed you. We uh, fitted it to the single junction circuit. Then we made predictions from the double, for the double junction circuit and we compared it to experimental data for the double junction. And we have reasonably good alignment, okay? Reasonably good alignment. So status is just another name for uh, anchorages. So what we were able to do is we were able to confirm that the leak reactions happen 
how, okay, by showing that the probability of uh, reaching the end by going on the outer paths, okay, is better. This is a more reliable than when it takes the inner path because it, it, the probability of reaching one of these states along the inner path is lower. Okay? And we could also formulate design rules to improve efficiency. Uh, but we uh, could also uh, do more. Okay? And what uh, we can also do is to take the model of the DNA walker but now consider some rates in it as parameters. Parameters, that is an unknown value, but you only specify the interval of that value. Okay? So you take a parametric model, and then you give it a reliability property, which is expressed in this probabilistic temporal logic or a performance property, and you ask yourself a question. What are the values of that parameter that actually guarantee that the property holds. And this can be done by uh, computing, partitioning the parameter space into the green regions, okay? In the green region, that means that uh, uh, this parameter, all the values in this region satisfy uh, the, the property. Uh, the red region means they definitely fail the property and uncertain, the yellow one, uh, which at the moment, this is quite a large region, but you can improve the precision of this answer by doing parameter, by doing a refining, and we also involve sampling, uh, and if you are interested, there is a recent uh, paper about this that, you know, maybe you can, uh, um, you can look up, okay? So what we did with this, is we could actually look at two reliability properties, okay, and ask for the conjunction. And what this is, says you want the probability of correct finish to be above some level, okay, uh, but the prob probability of incorrect finish to be small, okay? And you have the conjunction, specify the conjunction of these two. And what you can compute is these are the values that guarantee the satisfaction of the property. Within it, you can also optimize. Okay? So this is uh, um, what we have done. And just to sort of summarize, uh, uh, it's, uh, we've had some successes. So I can show, I can tell you that we know how to find bugs in DNA programs. Um, uh, we uh, can also guarantee the reliability level and performance of a Walker computation. We have also improved the computation, computational performance of probabilistic verification by employing you know, certain techniques, but the scalability is limited. So we have in soup, we have billions of molecules but DNA transducer, we can only model six or seven molecules. That's the limit, okay? Uh, for DNA walker circuits, uh, we have to resort to statistical model checking because it is physically impossible to construct the matrix, the state space. Uh, and for DNA origami folding, we could only use simulation. So it's only been explored uh, using simulation. This is not a CTMC, this is an inhomogeneous CTMC model. Uh, so uh, uh, this brings me to conclusions, and I wanted to say you know, that uh, from my personal perspective, this is a very exciting area and you know, very exciting field, and I hope that uh, you can sense my excitement uh, uh, about it. There are many, many open problems. And there are many, many open uh, issues to do with uh, verification. For example, compositionality. Can we synthesize Walker circuit layouts? And can we also do parameter and model, model synthesis for more complex models? Okay? Uh, I mean, for example, origami, DNA origami. Uh, and I wanted to finish off by saying thank you to 
my collaborators, my group and my funders, and ask you if you know about PhD comics. Do you know? Does anyone? Yeah, yeah. okay. So do, do you know that uh, Jorge, he came to Oxford? He came in 2008. This was the day after Obama was elected for the first time. And uh, do you know that I'm there? Okay, so this is, I'm at Trinity College. It's Trinity College, Oxford. It's not as grand as Trinity <laughs> College, Cambridge. Um, uh, so do you get the joke? Does the food pop up magically from the table? <laughs> no, not at Trinity, at Christ Church, because Harry Potter was filmed at Christ Church. And, uh, okay, the, uh, you can find the cartoons and the second desserts, okay? So dinner's at high table, you finish with second desserts. Okay, so thank you for your attention. <laughs> So we have time for questions. So the first question I have is like, uh, I've been interested, thanks for the talk on introduction to DNA computing. So when I look at it from a computing perspective, anything to do with computing should have kind of uh, storage and, uh, and the processing. So I, I got a very clear idea from your talk <laughs> that you address things about uh, combination circuits maybe, but there is still secret. Exactly. Circuits. So the thing is like with combination, I understood even with combination circuits, we need to first find AND gates and OR gates. And then you create NAND gates or NOT gates. And with that, you can build processes. Yeah. So, but I understood that you have XORs, but uh, I'm not clearly sure whether you have buffers so that we can realize. No, that's the next topic, yeah. Hopefully, that's the next topic in my group. I mean, from the verification point of view, yeah. Now, you are absolutely right. I've only showed you, you know, we can only do combinational circuits. We do need memory. I'm just interested to know, in a future perspective, how do we plan to interface this with real-world systems, to some extent? How do we interface this with, you know, really user data like to process you need to have an interface to which you can give input. Yes, well, so this is uh, again something in some small way uh, people have already used it uh, on um, Andy Ellington, for example, uh, for TB, um, has used it on paper fluidics. So he has developed DNA programs which you can put a print on paper fluidics and develop that technology. Uh, but I think longer term, people are thinking of using it to cure cancer and therefore injecting it into a bloodstream. But I think we are a long way off. And especially you've seen the reliability of Question. It's more from a macro high level perspective. How, how do you see the, the, the future from a, in, in general of, of, of this direction of technology? Uh, and how close are we from, from, uh, from, uh, from different real applications? Um, I suppose this is, I need to quote my collaborator, Andrew Turberfield. I think Andrew maybe can also add. Um, well, at the moment, there are a lot of proof of concepts. So all these are proof of concepts. And I think, uh, you know, to quote Andrew Turberfield, it's another 15, 20 years to actually get it to real applications. Well, the proof of concepts are different types of molecular walkers. Yeah, different. I've showed you one type, but there are also different types of molecular walkers. Um, I think what uh, we also need is to develop better technology for actually observing the behavior, uh, because a lot of, uh, for, for the molecular walkers model, we just had to do a lot of guessing. But Bailey Group at Oxford, they now have a paper where they can actually observe single, single molecule walkers in real time. So, yeah, we also need this technology. So 20 years from now, what, what do you see as a potential, for example, uh, <laughs> but, uh, where, where this could... Healthcare. So, 
medicine, so really, uh, yeah, doctor in a cell. So medicines that you can actually, uh, you know, deliver in, in the bloodstream. And, smart and detect smart, smart, smart medicines, smart therapeutics, yes. But there's, there's no computational slash CD processing dimension to it, uh, using basically biological uh, components as, as a form of computer architecture okay. for, for computing. Okay, so I suppose, uh, no, I think there is, there is, separately from that, there is, I'm focusing, because I'm working verification, so I'm focusing more on applications, you know, where you do need, you know, verification, because it's expensive, you know, it's expensive, but you have to use it, you know, for biosensors, for example, so that's the kind of uh, applications that I'm focusing on. Yeah, it's, I think we, yeah, you know, I think we still have uh, some way to go to actually build computers. You know, we have Boolean circuits, but to build computers and, you know, to build robots, we still have a long way to go experimentally. Okay, um, I have one last question. Uh, yeah. 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 So maybe I missed, how do you get your models? So they are uh, generated or extracted or prepared manually? Uh, Yes, so one way to get a model is to take visual DSD, which is Andrew Phillips's tool, and it has a tab in where you know it says export, and you can export it as a Prism modeling language. I didn't show you the Prism modeling language, uh, but you can also build models of you know CRNs, chemical reaction networks, directly in Prism. So that's another way, and we've done both. Uh, what you can also do, uh, and that's another paper, so DNA computation has exactly the same expressive power as PetriNets, so there is also a tool, uh, and you know, there is a paper, there is a tool called Cosmos, which is based around PetriNets. We have modeled the same molecular walkers using stochastic PetriNets. Okay, we'll end it there. Bye.